for our next panel, you will hear from some of the most senior deal makers in the private equity space. Now, there's a lot going on uh, in private equity these days in terms of trends. You're seeing high valuations, uh, questions around regulation, and even questions around the existence of the industry. So it should make for an interesting conversation. Our panel chair uh, needs no introduction. It's Olivier Sarkozy, the founder and managing partner of Further Capital. Today, he will be joined by Andrew Fair, managing director of General Atlantic. Julia Carr, senior managing director of, private, of the private equity group at Blackstone. Eric Liu, partner at EQ2. And Arjun Tamea, managing director, financial services at Warburg Pincus. I'll let you all take it away. Uh, Thank you uh, so much for that, for that introduction. I'm going to uh, just add one thing to it. I'm from New York City, and we did not uh, somehow put New York on the map in that recitation. So um, yeah, where is that place? Uh, we paid taxes over there. Um, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, private equity. With me, have uh, I have four very senior folks from... Uh, four of uh, the largest firms in the business. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves very briefly so you can uh, get a sense for who we're talking to, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, private equity and, and why we think it's uh, one of the greatest things on earth. Um, so with that, Andrew. Sure. Uh, my name is Andrew Ferrer. I'm a partner on the consumer team at General Atlantic. Uh, for those of you who don't know General Atlantic, uh, we have an office here in Greenwich. We're based in New York City. Uh, we have 14 offices around the world, uh, manage about $35 billion, and uh, we're exclusively focused on growth equity investing uh, across a few different sectors, which we can get into. Great. Hi, everybody. Julia Carr. I'm a partner at Blackstone in our private equity group. I lead our investments in the healthcare area, uh, and I've been at Blackstone about 15 years. I'm Eric Loom, a partner at EQT. Uh, we're a private equity firm based in Stockholm, Sweden, actually. Um, we actually just went public a few weeks ago as well. Uh, we manage about $40 billion of uh, euro of assets uh, under management. I'm Arjun Thwail. I'm a partner at, in, at Warburg Pincus. Uh, I focus on the financial services um, um, ecosystem, um, and we invest in everything from, from growth investments to buyouts um, in that space. Well, thanks for that, guys. And we're going to spend the next 35 minutes um, uh, cruising through private equity generally and what it is that we do and why we think it is a valuable um, way to invest, how firms differentiate themselves, et cetera. And then we'll end with a lightning round of questions where hopefully the audience uh, will participate, following which I think we'll have time for uh, whatever questions you all might have. So let me start with uh, the most basic of all questions, which is why private equity? We've seen the S&P 500 return 15% on average over the last three years, just under 13% over the last 10 years. Uh, we hear a lot about private equity returns being in the 20s, but that's, of course, before we take our modest fees. Um, why should an investor care about uh, private equity? And, and Eric, if you could, uh, if you could start us off. Great. Yes, I think one of the, um, if you think about the investors that provide us with the capital, they're typically insurance companies, pension companies, uh, you know, high net worth individuals. Sometimes they have um, actual return requirements. You know, people have to do an average 7 8% return requirement for their retirees. And one of the things that investors really like about private equity is it's an asset class that over time has demonstrated the ability to generate consistent double-digit returns, you know, depending on the firm, obviously, some are higher than others. But um, in terms of how the value is created, though, I think that's really why, why people care. I mean, I think when the industry first got started, it was a little bit of mispriced securities. I mean, there were certain companies that were perceived as boring, but they were really quite consistent in their cash flows. There were good companies, and private equity would buy those companies and generate an attractive return. You know, those days are pretty much over. I think valuations are high. I think most companies are generally pretty well run. And so when you're a private equity firm, the way you can generate consistent uh, above, um, or consistent high rates of return over time really requires you to improve the value of the companies that you're acquiring. And so sometimes what you can do is, and obviously it's easier to do when you don't have to mark to market every day, you can really think about things over the long term. And so I think as private equity firms, we can upgrade management teams and boards much more efficiently uh, I think a second thing we can do is a lot of firms have 
certain capability sets or certain relationships that they can bring to those companies that they wouldn't otherwise have themselves, whether it's digital capabilities, healthcare sector knowledge, software transformation knowledge. And then the third thing is that in a private equity ownership context, you can also do a lot of accretive um, acquisitions to enhance the value of the companies that wouldn't be as efficient as a, public, uh, as a publicly owned company. And so I think overall, I think the returns are good when you can demonstrate the value, ability to add value over time to companies and make them more valuable than they would have been had you not invested. Arjun, how do you guys think about it at Warburg? You know, I'd, I'd say the biggest advantage private equity has, or competitive advantage, is it's patient and flexible capital. So the patient helps you in that when you're building companies, we're thinking about building it for the next five, you know, seven years. Uh, and we can make investments like that. Um, you know, we, were, we just made an investment uh, a couple of months ago. And in sort of the strategy kickoff session, um, we sort of went through all the growth investments the company's going to make. And this is a business that is sort of, you know, is somewhat market dependent. And the CEO said, well, what happens if there's a market downturn next year? What do you want me to do? Take these investments off. And we said, no, actually, you know, what we care about is what this thing looks like in five, seven years. We've built a capital structure that, we, that will withstand um, a downturn. Um, and, you know, we, we look at the, ca the free cash flow characteristics of this business. Cash flows will go down, but, you, but you'll be able to manage through it. Um, but we care about sort of what this thing looks like at the end, which is five, seven years from now. So continue those investments. So that is sort of the, the patience that you don't get, you know, being public has some benefits, but being, being private um, and our form of capital gives you that, you know, that advantage where you don't have to think sort of short term, which is sort of a year or a quarter. Um, the flexibility is also we can adapt as the market adapts. So, you know, in financial services, we, um, what we were doing in sort of in, in, 19, in 2009, 2010 was sort of a lot of the recapitalization capital. So, so banks, insurance companies needed capital to sort of to, to survive. We were putting that capital in. Then we evolved to doing carve outs of businesses that they decided they didn't, they didn't want to do. And then we evolved to doing growth capital um, as sort of the markets recovered. Um, so, you know, we had the flexibility to sort of invest, like where the, the blank and scrabble. Yeah, I must say from um, what I've seen, um, the ability to be ROI focused, to not have to care about gap quarterly uh, requirements has really made all the difference. And um, talented managers 20 years ago uniformly wanted to run a public company. Now they all uniformly want to run private equity-backed um, companies. Uh, Julia, how, how does Blackstone differentiate itself? And, and you've got to differentiate yourself really for two people. One, one is your investor base. The other is the companies that you're looking to acquire. What, what do you point towards in a world that's so uh, now filled with private equity companies, where, whereas 10 years ago there were you know, half a dozen of them or so? Sure. Yeah, no, look, it is competitive, as you say, and I think it's really a couple things. Um, you know, Eric touched on, ultimately, we have to create value with the companies we buy, um, and so it's about what are we going to do with the companies we own, how can we leverage, and what resources do we have at Blackstone to help make those companies better? Um, and for us, the biggest single driver of returns is actually operational improvement and operational intervention at our companies. And that could mean anything from investing for growth, where in a public company context, you know, the management teams couldn't invest that capital on a quarter to quarter basis to drive, you know, the growth of a new business line. Uh, whether it's funding acquisitions, whether it's um, actually getting better at productivity and efficiency such that you can actually make more and therefore sell more of your product. Um, whether it's actually investing capital uh, in building new facilities, which is something that we often do with our companies. But we have a whole team at Blackstone that we think are real water walkers in their respective functional areas who help our companies um, as a free resource to our companies. And so that, for us, is the single biggest way you know, that we add value. Um, I think also just scale. So we've got a very large fund. Um, and so uh, we can be a single counterparty to um, whether it be a corporate who's selling a business or selling a partial stake in a business, in a case of, say, a Thomson Reuters, for example, where we were talking about a $20 billion deal, um, where you know, we were the single point you know, counterparty in that. Um, and so the trust in a, you know, in a very complex situation um, you know, is, is, is just very important, um, and the ability to move very quickly. Um, and so the scale and, and the experience, frankly, with, with corporate partnerships and the ability to um, 
structure things that are complex, um, that have high degree of sensitivity, um, you know, and to do that in a way um, that, um, you know, uh, preserves, um, you know, the reputation uh, and, and the business, the ongoing business that, that, that those, come, those corporates have. I think those are really the most important things. I think finally just the benefit of being at Blackstone is we have a number of other businesses, another, you know, a number of other alternative asset classes that can be actually also quite helpful. So real estate, we've got, you know, the leading real estate private equity business at Blackstone and having that as someone who can actually, you know, most of the companies were buying large global companies, most of them own real estate. Um, and so to be able to help them with their real estate, for example, um, or to actually get value out of that real estate in, in a different way. Um, you know, those are things that, um, that we bring to the table as well that, that, that help also um, create more value for our companies. I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, General Atlantic defines itself uh, by growth. And so what differentiates us is every thesis we have is a growth-driven thesis. Um, the median growth rate in our portfolio is 30%, uh, which obviously means, you know, half of the companies have even higher growth rates. Um, if you disaggregate our returns, three quarters comes from top line growth. Um, and so we're not big users of leverage. Uh, we don't underwrite multiple expansion generally. And, you know, we're not squeezing a bunch of margin out of these companies. It's really a growth based thesis, um, profitable companies for the most part, and trying to back the best businesses we can find um, and really help them for that next leg of growth. Um, we do have a set of resources uh, that are supposed to enable that growth. And it's everything from helping with the technology stack to pricing, marketing, uh, HR, org design, and compensation as these companies go through these growth phases. You know, we're catching them hopefully at a moment where the business is proven, uh, but they need to build the business uh, and the organization around what's a proven business model. And then I think the, the other lens that General Atlantic always takes, so we're one global pool of capital. Uh, we all invest out of the same uh, capital base across our 14 offices. And so we really try to leverage global opportunities. Um, I do all consumer. So, you know, we'll invest in a brand that might be based in Australia, but has growth opportunities in the US and Europe and China. And we'll connect the dots for them around the globe as they're looking to take over in these different markets and gain market share. Uh, and then the final piece really is our technology heritage. So uh, half of our investments are technology investments. Um, but that logic really flows through all of our investments in healthcare and financial services and consumer as well, really trying to be with businesses that are using technology uh, to improve and to beat the competition. Um, so, you know, between the globalization and the technology component, we're trying to pick the best businesses and, and back them. Yeah. I, I grew up as an investment banker in the financial services world. As consolidation took place, you saw these companies become massive. Uh, the entrepreneurialism at those companies just got killed. And what's really impressed me about all of your firms is how big you've become and yet how entrepreneurial you manage to remain. And I think it's really the, the critical difference that's um, <clears throat> allowed you to be so successful. Um, Talk a little bit about the environment. Uh, obviously, from a valuation perspective, it's uh, about as goofy as it's gotten in a while. Um, we promise, for the most part, 20% returns gross to our investors. Um, is that still the case in, in this uh, valuation environment? Or, or are we as an industry still really targeting 20%? Uh, and um, it, if so, how, how are we going to get there, given what the entry prices uh, look like? Arjun, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, when we look at, I mean, for our investments, I think we, you know, we, it's because we're doing growth to buyout. So we're looking at a return spectrum for our investments, where some things are sort of lower than 20% and some things are, are higher. Um, we also have the benefit of one fund, which we're doing, you know, energy, financial services, um, technology, and business services and around the world. So we sort of, you know, it's sort of, it, it's flexible capital, and it's dynamic, and we move capital towards where the opportunity is. So there's some areas we, we pull back from when the opportunity set isn't there. Um, but for individual investments, you know, the, for low-risk investments, the returns would be sort of in the high, you know, in the high teens for, um, for, for higher risk stuff, it's higher, but we're trying to still build a portfolio that has a 20% return. Um, but we pivot our capital based on where the opportunities are. Eric, that's the case at your shop too? 
Yeah, I said the, um, as Arjun said, I think the thing we think about is the risk reward spectrum. So there could be two deals that on a piece of paper look like they have a 20% return, but the reality is one of them, maybe there's no downside at all. The other one has to achieve a bunch of things in order to get to that return. And so you have to every time calibrate. But the reality is, it's funny, you spend so much time when you're looking at an investment. Is this 19%? Is it 21%? Because you can fidget with little things in the model that move it one way or another. But, and it feels like you're paying a lot more when you're pushing the return down to 19% or 18 or whatever the number happens to be. But once you actually own the company, the thing that we've seen over time is that the good companies are always better than you think, and the bad companies are always worse. <laughs> and you would think that there's like a bell curve distribution where like most deals would be kind of around 20%, but it's actually bimodal. It works the other way in the sense that the companies, the deals that don't work out, they usually really don't work out. And if you had paid 25% less, they'd still be bad because either the market was bad, the company was bad, or something happened. Whereas for the good companies, there's always more opportunity. You think you can do more M&A, you can attract better board members, better managers. Uh, maybe you exit earlier so the IRR is a bit higher, maybe you get multiple expansion. And so that's, you actually tend to see it go this way, even though at the actual decision point, it just sort of feels like, oh gosh, is it 19 or 21? Can I win or not? Um, but I think as a practical matter, what we found is that overall cycles, if you find the right deals, there are plenty of opportunities to deliver well in excess of 20% returns over time. I think that's right. Um, you know, I think all of us always look for a correlation between something and things that work so you can try to put it back into play and the only thing I've noticed that has any sort of uh, correlation is that a good management team typically produces a good outcome. Mm -hmm. A bad management team produces a bad outcome and if you really think about it we're sort of glorified HR people um, <laughs> which it's a good business. Um, the economic expansion uh, historically long, obviously, some would say, um, gone well beyond anything that uh, economic models would uh, typically suggest. When you're buying companies today and you're trying to generate that 20% return, are you building in a de facto recessionary environment? How do you, how do you think about that in the context of having to, to achieve these returns. Julia, you're, you're in healthcare. That's sort of <laughs> recession proof. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, nothing I think is recession proof. I think it's about how does the recession impact, you know, your specific business. I think certainly we've been spending a lot of time, we were talking about this earlier, on, um, you know, pharma services as an example and tech-enabled services that enable pharma companies to actually dramatically shorten the time of their clinical trials and also dramatically reduce the cost, right? So something like that as a business model, which is a relatively small expense that a pharma company is spending for massive ROI, you, know, you feel pretty good about that kind of a trade over a long period of time. Um, and, you know, pharma R&D budgets generally have been definitely not recession proof, recession proof, but much less sensitive to downturns than, say, industrial companies, right? So. Um, I think at the core, we try to be thoughtful about how is a downturn going to impact our specific business that we're looking at? How has it, we try to look forensically back as many cycles as, as we possibly can, and to the extent that it's a newer business, we can look overall at the underlying you know, end market to try to understand um, what happened in prior downturns. And then you know, I think certainly folks, I'm sure we all have somewhat different views, um, around what this next downturn will, will look like. I'm sure we all are thinking sometime here in the next few years there's going to be a downturn. It's a question of what kind of downturn. Are some sectors going to be you know, disproportionately affected versus others? Um, and what does that mean ultimately for the specific company that you're looking at? Um, you know, so you know, healthcare, yes, generally tends to be a more defensive industry um, than more cyclical ones, um, but it really, it's really about the specifics of that business and fundamentally what value are you providing and to the extent that you are underlying end customers or under any sort of financial stress, if you're actually providing, you know, an ROI for them, then perhaps you're, you're more protected than, um, you know, than other parts of, of that sector. Andrew, how do you guys think of your growth bias? Yeah, I think, first of all, it's from a portfolio management um, standpoint. So um, we're taking liquidity uh, all the time. Uh, last year, you know, while we invested four and a half billion of new equity out the door, we took five billion dollars of liquidity. 
So trying to manage risk uh, that way and always uh, capture liquidity where we can. Uh, second of all, our portfolio does not use a lot of leverage. Of a hundred plus portfolio companies, I think only four of them have more than five times debt on them. Uh, so it's overall a very low leverage environment for us in our portfolio, which through a recession we'll, we think will serve us well. Uh, and then in terms of specific deals, I think we are uh, really looking for business models um, that are recession resilient. I mean, again, in consumer, um, you're a little bit exposed to, to that macro environment, but um, we have an investment in a great company called Authentic Brands Group. Uh, they have a diversified portfolio of 50 different brands uh, that they manage through uh, long-term contracts and licenses and royalties. They don't have a bunch of leases. They don't have a bunch of inventory. And so really looking for those business models that as you imagine going through a recession, uh, you know will, will hold up well and come out on the other side uh, as strong as they were before. Arjun, since you're in a cyclical industry for sure, financial services, are you building in um, recessionary cases and uh, things that you're looking at? You, you bought a pet insurance company recently. Yeah, we've got pet insurance. Well, and yeah, that one's probably less cyclical, but we have, you know, we bought a, a wealth management business, you know, a couple of months before that, that is, um, you know, that has interest rate as well as sort of, you know, equity market sensitivity, right? Um, and frankly, we, you know, we, in our base case projections, now when we, we put our projections together, we sort of have an outcome, right? We have sort of a series of outcomes, and we're looking at sort of what is the spectrum of, of returns here look like. But if you had to sort of point towards that base case, um, we actually run a recession in all financial services stuff next year. Um, so um, we have basically the markets down, um, you know, equity markets down 20%, and we have interest rates going to 10 basis points. Um, and we have to have companies that sort of survive that. Um, now, in some ways, it, it, what matters is surviving through it, Right, and having a capital structure that is resilient through it. But I think we're cognizant that, listen, this is what the earnings would look like, um, and will it survive, and do we have a capital structure that is, is, um, is rock solid to get through that? How did you um, project uh, the pets? People stopped paying for their pets? When no, we expect to continue. I mean, it's a, that's, a bit of a, that's a penetration story in the U.S., so it's a, you know, it's, a very, it's, got a, it's a very low penetration business in the U.S. versus the rest, you know, versus Europe. It's sort of... 1% penetration versus sort of 25% penetration in Europe. Uh, so that one, you know, the secular trend should make up for it. People love people their pets. People are going to pay for yeah. the pets. I'm, I'm with you on that yeah. one. And what we've seen, actually, people take better care of their pets than they do of themselves in a down. So <laughs> it's, I'm sure you probably uh, I could relate. I could relate. Um, I promised Julia that we wouldn't get too political, but... Um, <laughs> It is, uh, private equity is getting on the radar screen here of um, uh, the political discourse. And uh, what does that mean? What are you doing to deal with it, um, get in front of it? Um, are, are, are we as an industry trying to f fight back is the wrong term, but change the perception? How, how are you guys thinking about um, about that environment going forward. Eric? Yeah, so the, um, the funny thing about the private equity industry, so I, I've been doing this since 1998, and when I first started, like, no one heard of what, I, I joined the Blackstone Group, and they're like, what, what is that? And, you know, when you're graduating college, you have to explain that to people. And, um, but it was a really, it was a cottage industry. We had a $3 billion fund, and there were a few other firms that existed that also no one had heard of um, that didn't employ that many people. And what's happened over time is that there's more of these firms, they're bigger, the deals are bigger, the companies are more well known in the press, you know, Mitt Romney ran for president, that really put a spotlight in the industry. Um, so that's sort of the media political side. But the other thing that's happened is, you know, when an industry gets to this size, I mean, some of this regulation is probably not a bad thing, right? I mean, you've got, you're dealing with pensioner money. Um, and so I, I would say that ever since I've been working here, there's just been more regulation. I mean, I think the a lot of the public, a lot of the large private equity firms these days are public. They're SEC registered. You know, it used to be that when we bought companies, you didn't have to, um, you didn't have to mark to market. But you actually do. You, you mark your portfolios once a quarter, every six months, and they actually get publicly audited. So I think that's something that's just happened over time as, as the industry's That's why everybody's first quartile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> audited. Um, 
But the other thing that's happened is obviously there's more, more of a political spotlight. I think obviously the whole financial crisis put a spotlight on uh, the financial sector generally. Um, but I think some of the more successful people in the financial services industry have been people who've run large private equity firms. And so that's put the spotlight on that. Obviously in, in the political environment generally, I think there's a spotlight on anything that seems to be too profitable, making too much money, including the tech industry. And I think that one of the things that's important for the industry to do is just to really clearly articulate the value that we're actually providing to society. And I think there's sometimes this perception in the media that oh, private equity firms buy companies that are perfectly healthy, they fire a bunch of people, the shareholders make money, and it's bad for everyone. And they realize that's not really how most deals, the vast majority of deals don't look like that. The industry is too competitive. The US economy is too vibrant for you to have companies sitting around where well, these people aren't doing anything. If we didn't have them, the company would be much more profitable. I mean, the most private equity deals that are done that are really successful deals are where you're growing the company, you're making it more profitable, you're hiring more people. And so I think one of the things that our firm does that we track every year is annual growth in revenue, annual growth in profit, annual growth in headcount at our portfolio companies. And I think over time, we've generated 10 plus percent uh, growth in each of those metrics over time across our companies. And that's obviously, well, EQD is a Swedish firm. Sweden's a socialist country. They don't really like things that are profitable. And so that's always been in our DNA. But I think for us, it's really important that we're doing things that are good and that we let people know the benefits of what we're doing. Um, and I think in the US, I think that's something that the industry has to do a bit better job of as well. Yeah. Arjun, you guys have, uh, sorry, Eric, go ahead. Uh, I, was just, I think when you look at it, right, the, the, just the pendulum of conversation in the U.S. is swinging a bit, and it applies to both private equity and public equity. Um, there used to be sort of a, a singular sort of due north of shareholder value, and delivering on that meant you were achieving what you set out to achieve. And I think there's a very healthy conversation going on right now of, you know, shareholder value is a very important component. That's obviously why we all do our jobs, but there are other constituents whose voices are getting more heavily weighted, uh, be it employees and the environment and all these things that I think all firms are really starting to reflect on more and we have an ESG initiative and, and really trying to say what is our broader impact besides still delivering the returns that we owe to our investors, what do we owe to the environment and employees and other constituents and I think you know, it's kind of swinging that way right now in the US which is probably a good thing. Arjun, you guys have stayed a partnership and um, stayed below the radar screen as a result. Um, how do you react to being called, you know, the evil private equity capitalists or whatever the, the latest uh, vitriol is? Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, so far we've actually benefited from, I think, a lower profile just because we've stayed, you know, um, private. Um, and that is, that, you know, that's helpful. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that we, we do believe is that if our companies are going to get a lot more scrutiny. So if we're going to make an investment, that company is going to get a lot more scrutiny than if we didn't make that investment. Um, and especially when you sort of combine sort of, you know, the, the, the feedback loop between sort of social media, you know, regulators and politicians, um, it can be quite vicious on any individual company. So for every individual company we're looking at, you know, one of the things that we're doing is sort of as part of, you know, when we make the investment, what are sort of the risks around this business from that aspect? And what are we doing to address that business? So a lot of our companies, we have a playbook in terms of how they are managing their their online profile, their, um, you know, their social media, because it, it, it matters from, you know, vendors are looking at it, uh, employee, you know, prospective employees are looking at it, so it is sort of increasingly important for, for them to look at it um, and them to manage it. So that's an area we sort of have a focus on, um, on managing that. Um, and at the same time, we are, we're still trying to figure this out, but, you know, we're trying to figure out what we make our companies from an ESG perspective, what we actually do. We have never been, you know, we've never come from sort of the philosophy of forcing our companies to do anything, um, but we give our companies a bunch of options if they say, you know, what, we try to figure out what they're doing from an ESG perspective, and if we don't think that's enough, we come to them with suggestions and, you know, and also ways for them to, you know, with people we have on staff who can help them think through implementing those suggestions. Well, what I find interesting, and, you know, I come from a political family, so take this uh, in the spirit in which it's meant, we actually, as an industry, I think, get a lot of pressure from our LPs to be very ESG or whatever acronym you want to uh, use or describe, to be very conscious of, um, of that issue. 
And we, in turn, have become, as an industry, I think, very conscious of the issue. And funnily enough, we're probably well ahead of the political environment in terms of addressing these issues and taking them seriously um, than uh, the verbiage that we're hearing would suggest. So another interesting uh, dichotomy. Um, in the time we've got left, we thought we'd do uh, a, a quick lightning round. Uh, maybe ask our panelists some fairly basic questions that uh, have a one-word answer, and then ask you in the audience uh, your views to see if uh, they're consistent. For instance, uh, will the S&P 500 be higher or lower 12 months from now? Eric. Uh, lower. 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 Higher. Higher. <laughs> In the room, uh, those who think lower, I guess the hires have it. Uh, we are a room of optimists. Actually, I would have been higher too. I just raised my hand anyway. Um, are interest rates 12 months from now higher or lower? Let's use the five year as an example. Eric. Uh. Flat. Flat. Andrew? <laughs> Andrew? Uh, lower. Lower? Lower. Flat. Flat or lower? <laughs> I, mean, I don't remember that being an option. There's always um, option C. In, huh? in the audience, lower? lower? Lower. Lower 12 months from now. Flat? Higher? <laughs> Nobody believes in inflation anymore. It's really kind of amazing. Um, Trade wars, do they intensify or relax over the next 12 months, Andrew? Relax. 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 Both. They intensify, <laughs> intensify and relax. So it'll, you can't it'll have it both ways. <laughs> it'll, it'll oscillate. Huh? In the audience, we think it relaxes. I think people think it intensifies. Uh, we're sort of 50-50. All right, uh, last question, and then we'll go to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, is the United States still the preeminent global power it was five years ago? Andrew? No, not to the same degree. Yes. Yes. Well, this is five years, yes. Ten years ago? No. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the audience, U.S. still the preeminent global power it was five years ago. A lot of people sort of think so, but it's uh, it's obviously changing. If anybody's taken that fundraising run in Asia where you start at the top and you go down south, you hit 10 cities, it makes JFK look like the third world. To, to, to be, it, uh, sorry, JFK is the third world. <laughs> um, we have exactly five minutes, which means I did my job properly. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. For audience questions, if there are any, please. Um, there are a lot more uh, tech companies that are They're going to so, give you a microphone. Uh, I'm just wondering if you've had to change your approach to potential targets based on either direct investors, uh, single or multifamily offices, or even public activists coming into similar opportunities. Julia, do you want to try the answering that one? Yeah, I mean, I think the activist trend, certainly in particular, um, has been a major one across um, you know the public markets, and I think. Um, it certainly catalyzed situations in a different way. I think the backdrop to that has been, you know, the public market environment has been pretty challenging um, for private equity investors given, you know, valuations. Um, and so um, we've done relatively less of public to private and relatively more of, you know, large corporate partnerships, private situations. Um, and so while it's been a factor, um, I, I, can't, I, I can't say necessarily that it's resulted in us doing more uh, of public to privates. Um, you know, I think in general, as we've all talked about, 
you know, the environment has gotten more competitive um, in terms of, you know, the different types, um, you know, of funds, the number of funds, the amount of capital going after attractive private equity-like situations. And so differentiating ourselves, bringing something different to the table in terms of what we can actually do with the companies to create value, I think, um, you know, that competitive intensity, you know, has, 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 has played out and will continue to play out. Um, and that's really where we're focused is on any single company that we're looking at investing in. You know, what are we going to do differently with the company? How are we going to grow the company, um, essentially? Um, and I think some, you know, several of us have sort of echoed that point in different ways. Please, sir. Thank you. Oh. Um, I think private equity has gotten some good press. Should I wait for no, please, yeah, please. I think private equity has gotten some good press because of the success of Yale's endowment model and how Swedish project has been so successful. Um, is it still true that um, the endowment model is helping you guys, or ha their returns are a little bit depressed from the, were the success of 10 years ago? Does that matter to you? Have you seen it? I want to read the press you're reading. <laughs> 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 I miss that one. Uh, Eric, how do you answer that? Yeah, I think, um, so Yale's obviously gotten good press for having a, a long-term kind of above market. I think that that... That, that positive press is generally applied to alternative assets as a category. I'm not sure that's related to private equity specifically. I think some of that may be more um, you know, hedge fund type thing. I think, I think private equity in, in the media has not generally gotten good press um, yeah. in the U.S. It's interesting because I think if you ask the most vocal critics of it, what is private equity? They would have absolutely no coherent answer to that. <laughs> It's just like this evil mass thing <laughs> over here. When we're running money for the same people that uh, Fidelity is running money for, or anybody else for, for that token. So it, it is time, in my view, for private equity to start making a much more concerted effort to educate people on who the heck we are and what it is that we do. Because I think a lot of... Um, a lot of the an, uh, animosity comes from a lack of understanding or, or knowledge. There was a question over there. We've had some discussion in the last couple of days about how much more of the investable world is now private versus public. And people who are participants in defined contribution plans have little or no access to the private investing that you guys do. And it's very consistent with what you just said, Oliver, is the reputation of private equity, I think, has to rise but I'd be interested in knowing what are you doing to try to get into the world of defined contribution plans, and will that be part and parcel, perhaps, of also trying to raise the reputation and help people understand the good that it does in the creation of wealth? Julia, you're at the biggest firm, so mm -hmm. I'm going to presuppose that you guys might be doing yeah. the most of trying to try Yeah, no, I mean, I think we, we've certainly tried to be creative um, in thinking about ways to um, allow individual investors to invest in our products, and we've got, you know, various different options for that. So I think as we look at over time, the pools of capital that are going into our various funds, not just private equity, but also our real estate private equity and our other investing funds, um, we are seeing more of individuals, um, more so that than per se, um, you know, defined uh, contribution at this stage. Uh, it's certainly something we're thinking a lot about. Um, and, um, you know, that was a little bit trickier to, um, to crack in terms of how to do that in a way that, that is effective and provides a liquidity. Because um, I think the biggest challenge is, is also just the liquidity there and people wanting, you know, those folks want to be able to access that capital quickly, um, and um, that creates a bit of a challenge with the way we invest and the time period over which we invest. One last question, please. So, private equity is in pirate equity, right? <laughs> I look at the stage up there, sorry, I look at the stage up there and I think of Pirates. Olivier with an eye patch on and <laughs> Arjun with a cutlass <laughs> swinging around. You talked about coordination among the industry, getting together to change that perception not only in Washington, D.C., but also in the popular press. What efforts are you taking across your firms to get that message out to both the popular press as well as D.C.? I took the eye patch off. <laughs> uh, yeah, please. sure. I mean, I think um, we've been historically a very under-the-radar firm, and that's been one of our sort of um, signature elements. And I think we're 
stepping forward a little bit more and trying to tell some of the positive stories that we can out of our portfolio and, uh, and companies that we've helped build. And I think it would be helpful if private equity takes that on the forefront a little more uh, and gets out in front of some of these stories and points to the great elements instead of being so reactive and waiting for the moment in time where you know, we've stubbed our toe or done something wrong. Those stories are very easy to uh, draw a lot of attention to. Um, and then we end up on our hind foot and uh, being reactive. And so I think it's just a matter of um, continuing to dial up how we tell the story of some of the successes and how we partner with, with companies and, and help build them um, and do more of that. Yeah, I mean, I think as a public company, I think we've been, we've been quite focused on sharing that message. I think Steve in particular has been a great spokesperson for the industry in terms of talking about even some of his recent comments just around job creation and some of the statistics which are really, we've all talked about different statistics, they're quite compelling um, in terms of um, what we've done to grow, grow employment at our companies. Um, and uh, so I think it is, it's just about getting that message out. Sometimes you know, um, it can fall on deaf ears, so we maybe have to speak even louder than we think we need to. Um, but I think we all own it as an industry, and I think we've tried to be quite outspoken about um, the statistics for our own uh, portfolio companies. Well, you've been a great audience. I want to thank you, thank our panelists, uh, thank the Greenwich Business Institute, and uh, appreciate the time you've given us today. Thank you very much. The 2019 Greenwich Economic Forum is brought to you by Bridgewater Associates. Meaningful work, meaningful relationships. Churchill Asset Management, Nuveen, a leading provider of senior and uni-trench debt to middle market companies. Ropes and Gray, bright past, brilliant future. Aurora Capital, inspiring partnerships. And Gramercy Funds Management, we are emerging markets. Special considerations to Bank of America. Life's better when we are connected. NOAA Private Wealth Management, a leading wealth and asset management service provider in China. Gotai Jinan Futures, a leading brokerage firm for commodity futures and financial futures in China. China Industrial Securities, a comprehensive financial group providing full spectrum financial services in Hong Kong. And Titan Advisors, built like a hedge fund. Special thanks to the Financial Times and Greenwich Business Institute for hosting us. And thank you to all the sponsors who helped make this event possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.